Good morning, everyone. How is everyone on this beautiful Saturday morning? The weather was perfect this morning. I loved it. So thank you all for coming out. Uh, my name is Sherry Minnick. I am the Events and Programs Director here at the museum. Um, I'm going to introduce you here to uh, Doug Malone. If you don't know him, he is our curator and uh, director of vehicle operations, and he's just going to he's going to wow you here with some fun facts about this Ford. So thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you all for coming out this morning. I always enjoy talking about the cars in our collection, and this Ford Fairlane 500 retractable is one of my favorites in the collection. And you're going to learn more about this car at the end of my uh, presentation. But a little bit of the history on the car. And you know, first, you know, why a hard top convertible? When we think about it, uh, back in the 1950s when this car came out, people loved the two-door hard top cars. They were very popular. And they loved convertibles, but both had downfalls. The hard top wasn't the open air experience that you had with a convertible. The convertible wasn't as secure as having a hard top and wasn't as warm in the winter. A little bit noisier from wind resistance with the convertible top. So they decided that the perfect solution would be to combine the two. So that's how we came up with where we are today with the Ford Retractable. Um, so where did the Skyliner name come from? Because this car is known as a Skyliner through all three production years. And it actually started in 1954 uh, on the Ford. And this is a 54. Uh, they're all about the same through 56, known as a Skyliner. Instead of having a full retractable hardtop, though, it had a, a acrylic, uh, clear acrylic uh, glass top uh, that was tinted green, uh, much like an overgrown sunroof that we have on cars today, uh, but something very uh, new for the 1950s. Um, but uh, there was also a sunscreen that you could zip on to, to block the sun if it got too warm, which it would. But on the Fords, they were, ba they were based on the Ford Crest line, and then Mercury also came out with one called the Sun Valley. I've heard reports that those cars really got hot on the inside because of those acrylic uh, roofs. So the Sun Valley name just seems to be more appropriate to me. Uh, it makes you think of heat. But uh, uh, anyway, that was based on the Monterey and the Montclair. So anyway, the Ford uh, Skyliner name comes dates back to 1954. There's also, and this confused me for the longest time, there's also a Ford Sunliner. What well, difference is the Sunliner is the soft top. And this is a 1957 Ford Fairlane 500, just like you see in front of you here, but with the soft top. So it was known as the Sunliner. This car here, this 1941 Chrysler Thunderbolt, was a concept car. Uh, this was a, a, a retractable, per se, a kind of a clamshell roof that folded in the trunk. Uh, they built five of these back in the early 1940s. Alex Tremulus was a designer of this car. If that name Alex Tremulus sounds familiar, it's because you probably heard of his name brought up either with the cord, because Alex Tremulus helped design the cord, like we have one of them out on our display floor. He also played a very big role in the 1948 Tucker. So he had some design skills, but anyway, Alex Tremulus came up with this car. So this next gentleman we're going to be talking about, Gil Spear, had seen this uh, Chrysler, and he got inspired by it, and he was the one that thought, well, I think we can come up with something for a production-type car. Gil Spear worked for Ford Motor Car Company. He was very artistic, kind of a designer, but he was also good at solving complex engineering issues. So Gil started designing some, some thoughts on how a retractable might work. Uh, his first design for the retractable was kind of unique, and that is that the hard top on the top, instead of folding in the trunk, actually would come back over the deck lid with the back window coming up over where the license plate would be on the back. So just kind of slid back and down, but was still exposed up on the top. And that was the one he first proposed to Ford uh, to the board of directors, and he made actually a little 1 8 inch uh, model, he called it the Roofomatic. And it, you could wind up with a paper clip and a rubber band or something that would operate. Anyway, he took that to the board of directors, and the first time it failed and the roof shot off. One of the board members had to apparently catch it in his hand. But he got to work again the second time, and they were really thrilled with, thrilled with how that worked and really thought, maybe this is something that we could do. But uh, the board of directors, one of the board members in particular said, you know, if you really want Ford to be sold on this, we need to get the roof off the trunk and get it inside the trunk. We need to figure out a way to get it tucked into the trunk. So they authorized him to build a 3 8 inch or 3 8 scale model of a working roof o -matic. And uh, so Gill went to start working on that. This was a result of that, this 1952 Ford Certus. And uh, uh, the, st the roof was steel. This was all made out of clay. 
but uh, it would, and they hooked up an electric motor to it, it would fold down underneath and the trunk would come down. Interesting thing is the rear window on this car right here would flip from here to here. So when you could either have it like a second windshield uh, in the back or you could flip it back wherever you wanted and then the, the rest of it tucked down into the, to the trunk. But uh, he took this to Ford and um, they liked it. They liked the idea. So they authorized uh, 2.19 million to uh, pursue getting this built. Um, Ford engineers worked on it for like six months and came back to the board of directors with like a one inch booklet on why it could not be done. It was just not gonna work. It was gonna be a, a nightmare engineering wise and would be a lot of issues with it. And um, so William Clay Ford, who was Henry Ford's grandson, had just been assigned to the Special or Advanced Projects Division. That was a secret division that was gonna be developing the Continental Mark II. And William Clay saw this and thought, what a perfect thing to put on our new Continental Mark II. And so it was assigned to his Continental Division and he went to work on it. He hired uh, John Hollowell, who was the head of the project. And John Hollowell brought in an, a former Ford employee by the name of Ben Smith. And Ben Smith is really the one, I think, that had a crucial role in, in getting the retractable to work. Um, the Continental, this is what the end result was in 1956. You've probably seen ours on the display floor. Uh, it was a beautiful car. They were pretty much hand-built. But originally, the retractable was, was designed for this car. So this top would eventually you know, go back into here. You can see with the Continental hump in the back, that could have been a real engineering thing. But Gil Spear got it to, got it to work. And he was, he was given 18 months to develop it. And he got it done before 18 months. And he didn't use all of his budget, which is unheard of today. You know, you didn't use all your budget. But uh, he presented to the Ford uh, Board of Directors. And they said, well, this is great. But uh, Gil Spear said, but don't put it on the Continental. And one of the board members goes, young man, you don't tell the Board of Directors which car to put it on. And, and apparently Ben Smith said, well, it's your decision, but if you put on this Continental, which is already going to be a $10,000 car, it'll become a $12,000 car, and if the car fails and doesn't sell well, then the whole project's going to go under and you're going to lose it. And so Ford fortunately took that into consideration and decided to switch it from the Continental to switch it over to putting it in the 1957 Ford Fairlane, which is what we see here. Uh, they granted an additional $18 million for the project to get it done and went back to Ford engineers. Ford engineers were not happy about that because Ford was one, as you remember, that said it's not gonna work, it's gonna fail, don't do it. So when they were told that it could work, they weren't too fond of wanting to work on it. So what ended up happening was they formed a different division. The Continental Division was gonna work on it. They had their own set of engineers and occasionally they'd reach out to the Ford engineers who sometimes would help, most of the time they wouldn't, but uh, they designed it on a contract with, with Ford division. And uh, so it did get done. When you think about the engineering that went into this, it's quite complex. And uh, just to kind of give you an idea, there are seven reversible electric motors. I might just talk about that for a moment. Um, ben Smith, the guy that was working on this, knew that he wanted to be electric. He didn't want it to be hydraulic because the biggest nightmare was if there's a hydraulics in the roof and a line broke or something, if the lady sitting in the front seat, she doesn't want to have a hot hydraulic oil spraying on her. So he said, we can't do that, we gotta do electric. But it's gonna take little tiny electric motors. The smallest that they had was four and a half inches in diameter. He needed one one and a half inches in diameter. So he went to Bosch, who built their electric motors, and said, I need one 1.5 inches. And I said, can't be done. Well, um, Ben didn't take that lightly, so he went to their Bosch representative at Ford and said, hey, figure something out with your big wigs because otherwise I'm going to do it hydraulic and I'm not going to sell any motors for this project. The next morning he said there was a guy at the front door of his house with a $500 bottle of perfume for his wife and a promise that they'd have it built within 10 weeks for him. So they did develop the little one and a half inch electric motor for the retractable. There's also four lift jacks and uh, those were designed and patented by, by Ben Smith. 10 power relays, 10 limit switches, eight circuit breakers, four locking mechanisms for the roof, two locking mechanisms for the trunk lid, a neutral safety switch for the activation, an activation switch, a cycle indicator light, and 610 feet of wiring. That's pretty, <laughs> pretty amazing. 
we're going to operate this at the end of our presentation so you can see it working. But, you know, we didn't have computers back then to tell things when to turn on and turn off. So this was all done through these solenoids and limit switches, and it's really an amazing piece of engineering. Here's a shot on the inside of the car. This is a little switch that operates the top. You either push it to raise the top or pull it to, to uh, retract it back into the trunk. Uh, there's a little light that comes on right to the left of the speedometer gauge cluster that once you activate the top, that light comes on. You keep pushing or pulling the button until that light goes off. That means either fully open or fully closed. And this was the end result, was the 1957 Ford Fairlane, known as the Hideaway Hardtop. It was successful in the engineering. People loved it. Downside was the trunk space was very limited. When we open this up in a little bit, you'll be able to see what they call the basket or the bin, little area in there. You can, this has actual Ford luggage in it that you could buy that fit neatly in there. But that's the only space that you could put anything in. If you put anything else out here, it would get crushed or damage the, the mechanism when the roof went in. So not very much trunk space, and that was one of the things that hurt the cell of the car. So despite its crowd appeal, the Skyliner was not a success after a brisk 20,766 units for the 1957 model year, production dropped to 14,713 for 1958 and then 12,915 for 1959. The Sunliner, that's a soft top convertible, outsold the Skyliner almost three to one, mainly due to the added expense of the Skyliner, about $500 more than the soft top, and loss of trunk space. Ford decided to end production of the retractable hardtop as the new 1960 models would require many modifications at expense to continue. For those of you who know what the 1964 looks like, much lower, the back roof was more sloped and it was going to take a whole re-engineering of it. And since the numbers had been going down, they just didn't think it was worth it. By this time, you know, Ford had 20,000 or 20 million dollars invested and they had not recovered it yet in the sales of these cars through 1959. So one to recover some initial expense, they said, well, let's install it on something else. Let's put it on the Thunderbird. So that's what they did, but they got rid of the steel top. And they went back to the soft top, but uses the same type of mechanism. So the, as you can see here, the trunk is rear hinged, so you would push a button on the inside, which would pop the trunk lid. You go back and physically lift the lid up. This is what they called the flipper. You would have to flip that up, because it would have been tucked down for when it was closed physically flip that up, a little control knob here that you push to unlock it, and then there's a button on the inside of the trunk that you would push down on, and that would lower the soft top into the trunk. Then you physically take the lid, lower it, tuck the lid back down, or leave it up for that when it's open, I guess, and pull the lid back down and lock it. So that was more of a manual type roof. In 1960 on the Thunderbird, they did it all so it could be operated electronically. So the flipper would go up by itself, and you could operate it from inside the car, but it did use the soft top. They used this from 1960 to 66. They also used it on the Lincoln Continental Convertible, and it was, a lot of people say this was the reason that the four-door Continental Convertible was developed, was to use this top to help recover some of the expense of initial engineering, and people loved it again. It was a soft top, but it worked well. The interesting, they put on a four-door, not the two-door uh, Continental, but uh, it's only available on the four-door uh, Lincoln Continental. And that went through 1967. So anyway, this is the, uh, the end result of the 57 Ford Fairlane 500 Scott. This is our car here, uh, showing its stuff with the top partially opened there back behind the building here. The tail end uh, on the 57, you, I want you to look, watch the changes as we go through these years, what changes. The rear end on the 57, uh, small circular lights, a little bit of a tail fin, which is you know still popular in the 1950s. Uh, massive, uh, bit large bumper. This has a dual exhaust, uh, two-tone paint finishes, very common in those days. The dashboard on the 57. Here we have the kind of the crescent-shaped speedometer. Here's a little light indicator that comes on when you're operating the top. Uh, this car has power steering, uh, power brakes, swift sure power brakes. Automatic, automatic two-speed transmission. Um, over here we have the heater and defroster controls, the AM radio, the clock, ashtray, glove compartment. Down here we have the ignition switch. On Ford it's unique, it's on the left side. Um, then you have the uh, um, uh, vent control for the air return. 
I'm drawing a blank, I can't remember what that one is. Lights, lights. Uh, on this side, you have the right control, uh, the lighter, and the windshield wipers. Um, so anyway, notice the black knobs, black gear shift knob, uh, black knobs on the controls here. Because when we go to the next year, it's going to change a little bit. And the 57 colors, beautiful colors of 1957 for this car. Uh, you can see a whole rainbow of colors. Uh, our car here is finished in what they called silver mocha poly and dusk rose. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about those colors in a little bit, but uh, uh, the dusk rose was a Thunderbird color, so it was a special order color. But you can get a whole bunch of these. You can paint them all single color or two-stage, uh, two-tone paints. Here's the 58 Ford Fairlane 5 and Scholar. You notice the change in the grill, much more massive. What do we notice also different on the front of this car? Anybody? Headlights. The headlights. We come to four headlights. Those are made legal now in all 50 states and 19, well not 49 states in 1958, I guess, um, uh, to have four headlights. Prior to that, you can only have two lights. You have a high beam and a low beam light. Of course, that was the new thing, so all cars were coming out with quad headlights. Uh, so we see that on the first time on the 58 Ford Fairlane. Uh, the stripe, the anodized gold stripe, a little bit lower on this car. This profile looking very similar. Go on to the back of the car and the tail lights change significantly. Remember we had the little round singular ones on the 57. Now we're going to this quad light setup. Um, here again, the massive uh, rear bumper. The dashboard, much brighter, lighter, and that's just a change from going from the black to the white. The back face of the speedometer is now white instead of the black. We have white knobs and control knobs. Uh, but outside of that, very similar dash layout uh, to the 57. This has aftermarket uh, air conditioning. You can see tucked underneath the dashboard there. And the colors for the 58, still beautiful. A big range of colors, not quite as vibrant as they were in 1957, uh, but still a pretty uh, arrangement of colors. Then we go to the 1959, and quite a few changes in the 59. Uh, we've got the massive uh, large round tail lights, little backup lights hidden up here in the tail fin area. Uh, this car has a Continental kit. It's not uncommon for a lot of these retractables to use the Continental kit because the spare tire, if you don't have the Continental kit, is hidden underneath that bin that held the luggage. So if you need to get your spare out, you had to not only open the, the top up, you had to use thumb wing nuts remove the bin, then there's bolts to hold the little cover over the spare tire and pull it out to get the spare tire out. So it was, it was a complicated thing if you had a flat tire. So a lot of people use the Continental kit. Personally, I think these look hideous on the back of these cars. I don't like the way they stick out so far. It looks like a boat diving ramp or something, I don't know. But uh, we had the option of putting it on this car and we ordered it and I said, uh -uh. I, don't, I don't think that looks as good. So. Um, but it was common to see those on retractable hardtops. Beautiful aqua color on this car. Um, here again, we still got the very same type of a, this one's not gold, but very similar type of a side stripe there. Um, front, much different. We have the four headlights, but the grill's entirely different, more clean than the 58. We've lost the mock air intake that was on the 58 hood that was just decorative. Uh, much larger looking car. And the dashboard on it, very similar, and the only change was in the speedometer. But instead of having the crescent-shaped uh, speedometer and gauge cluster, it was more oblong. Uh, but we're still using the lighter colors uh, to, to keep it air, airy and light. I always loved on these 50s cars that the interiors and the exteriors kind of blended in the bright colors. Or they were just fun cars to get in and, and drive. And here's the colors for 1959. Here again, quite a range, a little bit more subdued. As we're getting closer to 1960, we're losing, starting to lose some of the pastel colors. Something that was also on the 57, it came out in 1956, was their lifeguard design safety features. And you'll see a lot of those on this 57 here. And one of them was the deep dish steering wheel uh, that was designed so if in the event of a crash, you, the steering wheel would flex and you wouldn't have that hub right into your chest. Right away, you had about four or five inches crumple zone. You had padded dashes that were available. Uh, double locks on the front door, so upon impact, it had a double lock, so the door wouldn't swing open and fling you out because seat belts were something that was still new on a lot of cars. Ford introduced seat belts on their cars in the mid-50s. People hated them. 
they just they t tend to roll them up and tuck them down the seats. They didn't want to sit on them. And like Lee Iacocca said, well, you're not supposed to sit on them, you're supposed to, to latch them. Um, but uh, uh, people didn't, but uh, they were installed on Fords. Uh, but people thought it meant the car wasn't safe. You know, had seat belts, and the car must not be safe. This wasn't, we weren't to that point yet of looking at safety. But Ford was really about safety in the mid 1950s, late 50s, so they call it the lifeguard design safety features. This car has, has those, as you'll see. So the story of our museum's 57 Ford Fairlane dates back about six years. We'd gone to a, or I should say, not we, I wasn't, Ward Morgan and one of our board members went to a Mecham auction in Kansas City, and this car was there. This is the picture of it that they took. Um, Ward fell in love with it and bid on it, but uh, lost out on the bid. And he says later, I wish I'd have bid a little bit more and got it. But anyway, they didn't get it. And so Ward had told me about this car, and he told me about the colors of it. And so for the last, the next four or five years, I was on the search for one. You know, I was really looking for one. I could find this car in a Sunliner in these colors with the soft top, but I could never seem to find the retractable. And so I'd just about given up, and we were looking at very serious the 1959 model that was a two-tone blue, beautiful color combination on a 59 Ford. But I just always liked the looks of the 57 better. Just to me, it was more stylish. And so we were about ready to make an offer on this 59 Ford, and it had just come out of restoration. A guy down in Arkansas, Springdale, Arkansas, by the name of Jerry Miller, had restored that car. So I called down to talk to Jerry Miller to find out about the restoration and what he thought of the car. And during our conversation, I just happened to mention to him, I said, well, I said, we're kind of selling on this car because I said, we had seen a 1957 at the Meekham auction seven years ago or six years ago and this color combination. And he just started laughing. And I thought, what's he laughing at? He goes, he goes, I did that car. I was the one selling that car at the Meekham auction. Sure enough, look down here, it's got his name on it, Jerry Miller. I didn't pick that up at first, you know, but after he told me, I said, oh, he says, I'll tell you what, I've got a car down in Texas I've been thinking about buying. It's in a, in a in a field, but he said it's a dry, it's a pretty much rust free car. So I was going to buy that car and restore it. He said, if you guys are interested, let's buy that car and let's restore it in those color combinations exactly like you want. So that's what we decided to do. Well, it was a fun experience. We went down and visited Jerry at his place down in Springdale, talking about a cool place. This guy specializes in building these cars, mainly retractables, but also Sunliners and, and Rancheros of that period, but mainly, mainly Skyliners. And uh, this guy's shop, I kid you not, you upstairs of this warehouse area was shelf after shelf. You could walk down this shelf, there'd be 50 radios that had been restored. Gas gauges, speedometers, seats that had been reupholstered in their correct fabrics, windshields, any chrome trim piece all fully redone, ready to put on a car after during the restoration. It's like going into a Ford production line and just pulling the parts off and putting them on your car. And we, when we were having the car restored, he goes, what options do you want on it? I says, well, does that, he goes, you can put anything on it you want. It's like building a brand new car. So we, you know, power windows, yeah, check. Power brakes, yeah, check. Power steering, yeah, check. You know, so just like wearing a brand new car, it was so much fun. Then nine months later, we got it back. But uh, anyway, this is the picture of what the car looked like when he got it back to his place. That's Jerry Miller, the guy that owns the shop. That's me and our mechanic, Nick Pell, went down to, uh, to see the place. Uh, it was a black and white car. Uh, like he said, it was very solid, but uh, needed to be restored. Uh, so that's what we started off with. That's a picture of the interior, what it looked like. The seats were gone, but you can see the floorboards. There's a big hole here in the transmission tunnel where they had put a floor, four speed, they'd gotten rid of the automatic and put a four speed shifter in, so there's a hole in the transmission tunnel. Uh, you can see some of the solenoids behind the back seat where the uh, hard top retractable operated from. This was once the body was removed and flipped up. They bead blasted it to strip it down. Here's where the hole is. You can see where the transmission hump where the gear shift was. We can see some rust through on the back floorboards. But outside of that, pretty solid little car. This is after they'd fixed all that. You can see the, the hole in the transmission tunnel is now gone. Uh, the, the rust through areas and the floorboards repaired. And they sprayed it with the initial coat of uh, dusk rose paint on the inside. Of course, the frame was all bead blasted and painted a chassis black. 
all the nuts, bolts, screws were all blasted and replated. Uh, springs, everything, just like a brand new car. Getting ready to go back onto this car. Here we can see it coming together. There's the, uh, the back axle. Here we can see one of the wheels with the uh, wheel cylinders and the uh, brake pads and stuff being installed. Uh, shock tower and suspension in the front. It's parts ready to come onto the car. And the dust grows paint starting to go on more of the car. All right, you can see all the work that's being done. These two holes here hold the roof uh, supports for the retractable. That's one of the things the Ford engineers had a fit about uh, the design team because they didn't originally have a trim piece planned for that. It was just supposed to be smooth. So now they're going to have to develop a trim piece to cover that up. They thought that was too much hassle. But um, anyway, beautiful trim piece that eventually went on there. Uh, but um, here's the car getting ready for paint. Inside view of the back trunk area, and we see this starting to come together, and they're checking fit and fi fit and stuff before they sent to paint. Exterior paint. Engines that were available for these three model years, there were a number of different engines, all V8s. Um, the least for the 1957 model year was a 272 cubic inch. The most powerful for 57 was a 312 cubic inch, known as a Thunderbird V8. That's what this car is equipped with. Uh, then different engines, you know, they kept getting more powerful through 59. That will show you the different uh, cubic inches and, and uh, horsepowers for the different engines through those three model years. This is what the engine looked like that was in our bone car. And they, I don't believe they actually used this engine. They had another engine that was in the process of being restored, which I think is what they used. So we wanted a Thunderbird V8. So this is the engine when they're getting ready to paint it. it had been rebuilt. Um, I always looked at these, I thought these valve covers looked nasty. Well, those are just there for paint. They, those aren't the ones they use. Um, the transmission, the Ford Mac transmission having been rebuilt and prepped for installation. And then the body, getting ready to receive the engine and transmission. Then the engine wants us reinstalled in the car. You see what a beautiful job they did. It's got the optional Thunderbird uh, chrome valve covers on it. Um, but just a beautifully detailed down to having the correct labels and stuff on the engine bay, in, in the engine bay. Here we can see the two colors now made it up. We have the, the silver mocha tint, interesting name for brown to me, but silver mocha tint, and the dusk rose. Uh, chrome trim has not been put on yet. Starting to install the interior. Here we see the gas tank being installed in the back. It goes behind the back seat. Um, and then the dash, we have a padded dash. Um, we can see they're starting to install the wiring and stuff in the car. Uh, the steering wheel here again is just a, just a steering wheel they use. They put the finished one on the car when the car is all done. They don't want to take a chance of scratching it or damaging it. Here we're seeing the chrome starting to be put on. Um, checking the operation, the retractable. Here's a little trim piece I was telling you about that they had to develop to cover those uh, bolt access holes. Here you can see where all the solenoids are going to go for the operation of the top. And we talked about with the spare tires that goes underneath this wood, wood panel here, but uh, that bolts on. Then the suitcase bin sits on top of that. You can see all the wiring starting to take place in the car. Here's the solenoids and the limit switches and stuff in here. Here again, we're getting closer. They've got the tires on it now, the new tires. Uh, the finished wheels, um, so it's coming together. They've got the replated gold anodized uh, trim piece on the car. Just about finished. Um, they still have to add the uh, optional uh, bumper guard V up here yet and the full wheel covers, but it's getting pretty close to being finished. And then the finished car showing off uh, back here behind our building. So anyway, that's the story of the Ford Retractable. I'm going to start it up here in a minute. We'll operate the top so you can see how it works, and we'll leave it halfway open once we do that so you can see everything slips in the back. I'll be up here to answer any questions you have. If you want to sit in the car, let you sit in it. But any questions anybody has? Doug, what was the weight delta between the, the soft top and hard top? The retail on this car was around $3,000. No, weight. Oh, the weight. Well, i got to look here. 
Uh, this one is 3,916 pounds. I think it was like 500 pounds difference in them. Carl, don't hold me to that, but it was it was significant, significant weight alone. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I've read 500 pounds. Did they have to do anything different with the, the battery source to power it? No, they didn't do anything different with the battery source, but they, they want you to keep start the car and run it at pretty high RPMs to, to give it the juice that it needs. They said you can operate the top without having the car turned on, but it's hard on hard on the hard on it. So uh, one thing they did have to extend at three inches in the back, the trunk space to allow the roof to go in. And you'll notice when we when we open up the top, it does have a, a hinge along the top where the front third or fourth of the hood actually, or the top, folds under. So it makes room for when it tucks into the trunk. So when we operate it, uh, when the trunk, when, I, it'll, when we open it up, you'll be able to see that swing out before it comes down in the seats on the, on the front windshield header. Then it just reverses that when it goes in. Same with the back package shelf area behind the back seat. This area right here, when this lid opens up, um, that will tuck under before it closes back down to make room for the for the top. So a lot of mechanics, different things opening and closing and as it operates. So it's fun to watch. It's amazing that at all times it works works correctly. Any other questions? So what was the price difference? Uh, between this one and the soft top, about five hundred dollars. Very good. Well thank you all. Let's start it up and operate it and come and check it out. And I guess if you want to sit, I'll let you sit in it. So. Now that we have the rear end open here, we can see how all the mechanicals for the retractable hardtop work and the features inside the rear end here. One of the things that Ford did was put what they call this basket or this metal bin in the back. That was a protective area. You're very limited in space and they're Ford retractable and what you could put in the trunk. So only things that would fit inside this metal bin uh, would not get squished when the top came down to tuck and put away once the top was open. So you will see some suitcases tucked in there. Underneath this bin is a spare tire which you can see there's a couple of attachment bolts down here. So you'd have to remove this bin by turning the wing nuts, removing this, taking that bolt out, lifting that up, making sure your top's up high enough to be able to pull the spare tire out. So it made it very difficult to get a tire out of this car if you had a flat tire. That's why it's very common on these retractable cars to see what they called a Continental kit on the back to carry the spare tire instead of in the trunk. Also stored in the trunk area is the jack, in case you have a flat tire, it's tucked in here. And then these protective panel right here covers all the electric solenoids, which help activate the switches to activate the top. Here in a moment, we're gonna demonstrate how the top retracts into the trunk, but you'll notice that there are several different pieces to the whole mechanism. One that we first noticed in the overall hard top roof, is it does have a split in it, when this is open completely, you'll notice as it activates that this will swing up before it comes down to close the, over the top. The same with the overall trunk lid. There's a separate panel up here, which is your package shelf. And when this uh, vehicle is being activated for the top, this will fold and move down to be tucked in or open back up as needed to control how this needs to fit or the top is opened or closed. As it's opened up, the top will open up. This will tuck in and eventually will completely tuck in so it was able to fold into the trunk. To activate the top's operation, first thing is the car has to be started. So we will go ahead and start the vehicle here in a moment. Once the car is started, we will put it in neutral. Neutral is what activates the control switch to be able to be turned on for the top. And then once it's in neutral and the car is running, we'll either push or pull the button, depending on whether we want the top to go up or go down. And once we do activate it, there'll be a red light that will come on over here. That red light lets us know that the top is in motion and you need to keep pushing or pulling the button until that red light goes off. That red light, when it goes off, lets you know the top is completely secured up or down. 